was uh, poking holes in cumulus uh, nimbus uh, during the first hour of the show. Um, I think uh, those who have been listening know that I have a, a son and a daughter-in-law in Ohio that are uh, expecting our first granddaughter and that um, uh, we are closing on a home here so that we can enjoy the process of being grandparents. Well, uh, today I flew into Ohio. I was planning on doing it after the show, but um, thunderstorms were uh, in a vertical line all the way from the Gulf of Mexico up into Canada. And since it's a plane that's unfamiliar to me, it seemed uh, the better part of discretion to fly out this morning, land safely, and then uh, do the second hour from uh, the airport FBO, which is where I'm sitting right now. My faithful companion, my English lab, is here with me, and we're broadcasting from uh, an uh, airport uh, FBO here in Ohio. It was fun, though, for me just to listen, because I was able to listen to the last probably 25 minutes of the discussion on uh, Noah and how Noah actually serves, the story of Noah serves as a dress rehearsal for the covenant. Even as we were talking about the the rainbow, one of the reasons the rainbow was a sign of the covenant is that the rainbow is uh, light. It's um, sunlight uh, then uh, divided into its various components. So you have the full spectrum of light, light in every possible shade and hue, brilliant and beautiful. And when we are born into Yahweh's family and uh, perfected and uh, made immortal like light and uh, like light perfected and then uh, made more in Yahweh's image, which is like light, we become enriched and empowered on Shavuot. Those are the five benefits of the covenant. Uh, immortality, perfection, adoption, enrichment, and uh, empowerment. All of that comes by way of light. We get every possible shade and hue, the full spectrum of light. And collectively, this, uh, this light then, in all of its beauty, in all of its glory, in all of its component parts, is really a perfect sign to tell us that the rains have done their business, we have been cleansed, and now that we are perfected uh, and uh, safe in Yahweh's uh, Ark of the Covenant, that we're going to be enriched and empowered with the beauty of uh, and full spectrum of his light. That was um, an interesting journey through a dress rehearsal, Kirk, that we didn't even know was a dress rehearsal. Surprise to me that we yeah. break them so easy. I mean, so perfectly. Yeah, along with the presentation of each of the terms and conditions, and you, you had Noah um, in the first step, having to decide that he and his family were going to walk away from the community of man, mm -hmm. uh, from all of the confusion that was so um, caustic to humankind of the violence of human institutions. So the very first thing is is that uh, Noah and his family had to say, we're going to separate ourselves from the community of man and from human institutions. And then we're going where, God, where Yahweh is. Yeah. You can walk yeah, away and, the uh, desert right. and go away. So. Right. Yeah, it's not just that we're walking away. We're uh, walking away choosing rather than trusting Human protection, you know, even back in the day, they uh, they would have had armies and police and militias. And, and, you know, if you lived in the community of man, while well, man was very violent, within the community, they would try to protect you from other communities of man that would come in and rob and rape and plunder. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's to say, no, we're going to go on our own. We're going to leave you. We're no longer going to rely on any protections that you have to uh, to offer. In fact, you know, we're we're not even going to provide for any protection we're going to trust and rely on Yahweh, totally. which is what they did. Mm -hmm. And those are the first two conditions of the covenant, to walk away from your country, from the human family, from Babel confusion, Babylon, religion and politics, militarism and the like. And the second is to trust, trust and rely on Yahweh instead. And they certainly did that. 
Yeah, you know, it's a it's a little bit of a uh, of a leap here, but I'm sure you've been following the news regarding Greece uh -huh. and how the Greeks uh, overwhelmingly uh, voted uh, against what they called austerity, or against what they called yeah. blackmail, uh, against what they called was economic terrorism, and that somehow they were entitled to their pensions, they were entitled to their their uh, overzealous uh, um, uh, salaries for for government work, they were um, entitled to their their entitlement state, and even though they couldn't pay for it, and that it was the responsibility of the others to uh, to um, pay for them. In other words, they became total complete dependents, and and thought they had a right to be a, a dependent on human institutions. That's the odd thing to me. They absolutely believe that somebody is supposed to bail them out. Right. Why, why that somebody is supposed to. Well? Somebody, yeah, somebody who has worked and earned uh, uh, a living has paid their way and now has a surplus, that those people are supposed to uh, bail them out and, uh, and turn over their money to the Greeks who are unwilling to work for it. And they feel like they're entitled to I mean, it's uh it's a, a view of the legalized stealing from their point of view. It's it's legal, moral, and appropriate for them to uh, to force others to pay for their indulgences. But the point I want to make is they have turned to their government, to to human institutions upon which they are wholly and completely uh, dependent. And uh, and you know that by comparison to um, uh, to Yahweh's plan, which is that uh, you know he has no interest whatsoever, and us uh, in fact he's just the opposite. Don't be dependent on human institutions. And how, by the way, how's it turning out for the Greeks? Well, I don't. <laughs> when you can only go to the ATM and get fifty bucks, I mean you're in deep too. I was just, yeah. I mean I don't know how you can live on that, but I could. No. The rent check is going to be due eventually. I mean, all right. So it's not turning out well at all for the Greeks. As a matter of fact, even if they're if they're afforded some form of indulgence um, in the short term, you know, if if they're given um, some ability to uh, to um, uh, you know to con the people they've been besmirching into giving them more uh, money, they it's there's nothing in the Greek mindset. That's going to resolve their problem. They're going to remain dependent, and therefore they're going to be right back in this predicament. So, depending on government, hasn't worked out very well for them, has it? Well, I don't think it's worked out for anybody. I mean, the guy who's uh, the banks that loan them the money, they have a big debt, and now they can afford it, I guess, to write that off. But still, mm -hmm. they want to get their money back. Uh, that was the whole point of loaning money: is to pay and get it paid back with interest and make profit on it. Yeah. But uh, they don't, obviously they don't have any control, they didn't get any control out of this deal, so do you keep on pouring more mo bad money, I mean good money after bad? I don't know. Well, that is the mentality of, uh, of central banks, is continuing to pour more bad money after bad, uh, as opposed to a day of, uh, of reckoning that shows the whole thing is a shell game. But that's the very thing that Yahweh said, don't allow yourself to become dependent upon government. If you'll trust and rely on me instead, things will work out better. So here's a country, Greece, where, what, 90 plus percent of the citizens are part of the uh, Greek Orthodox Church? Mm -hmm. And uh, and there's uh, less than probably one in a million Greeks who know Yahweh and who are trusting and relying on him. Mm -hmm. And that's the plan. If you're not willing to do that, if Noah and his family said, you know, God, we'll trust you, but only so far. You know, we'll, we'll go ahead and uh, we'll play a boat with you. But um, as for uh, our protection service, we're going we're gonna to still um, be part of the human community. And, as, and for economics, we're still going to trade with them and, and, uh, and buy their grain and be, able to depend, be dependent upon them. They would never have sailed off with Yahweh. Well, we wouldn't have that story, would we? No. No, you you have to not only disassociate from your country, from the institutions of man, from Babel, but uh, you need to um, come to know Yahweh, come to understand what it is that he's offering and expecting, 
and to trust and rely on him and his plan. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing he said is, uh, come to me and be perfect. Right. Well, in their case, their path to him was, uh, was laid out exactly like the path that we have. The first step of the way was through the doorway of life, Passover. That's why that doorway was so pronounced in its de uh, depictions. You know, a doorway on the side of a, of a ship. Probably not a good place to put a hole, is it? No. It worked out fine, didn't it? It did. Yep. So Yahweh created the doorway to life. He calls it Passover. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, you know, even, even in Egypt, the first Passover, they were to uh, smear some of the lamb's blood on the uprights and vertical of that um, of that doorway. You know, at the time, it was pretty scary outside there in Egypt, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Would you have wanted to go outside uh, in Egypt at the time to uh, to confront all that? I mean, the, this was the uh, the tenth of the ten plagues. I mean, the, the Egyptians wanted to kill him. The oh, Pharaoh yeah. wanted to kill him. Uh, the the you know, the consequence of the plague was deadly. Do you think you'd want to go outside and uh, in um, uh, that door? I mean, it's kind of like the uh, Noah's Ark. No, it's uh, you get caught out there, you they'll kill you. Yeah. I mean, you don't want to be on the street just doing a run. No, you want to be inside. You want to make sure that uh, you've got the right markings on that door so that uh, you're protected. And then, of course, uh, matzah is all about cleansing. Cleansing in, in uh, Hebrew throughout the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms is always conveyed by ma'am, the waters. And the waters came welled up from the sea. The waters came down from the sky. The waters uh, came uh, bursting forth from underground cisterns, you know, cleansing. And immediately upon the, them closing the door, they were cleansed. That's matzah. So we have Pesach with the doorway, matzah with cleansing. And now the family of Noah became the family of Yahweh, protected inside of the ark. He adopted them. He became yeah. responsible for them. We have the celebration of Bukhutam. Yeah. Once you have Matzah, though, you can never get confused again about uh, salvation, shalom, or mm -hmm. reconciliation. I mean, once yeah. you get it, you can't be talking anything else. Right. We're saved on Matzah. We'll be back. So now that we have Noah and his family all protected inside of the ark that Yahweh designed for them, where he provided the instructions, all they had to do is engage on uh, on uh, their behalf, really. Mm -hmm. um, then we have um, seven sevens later. After the 40 days of 40 nights, of course, we send out the uh, the two uh, doves. And finally one comes back with an olive branch, and, uh, and the waters then begin to recede. And 49 days thereafter, we have the celebration of the promise of seven, of Shavuot. Mm -hmm. And... They are enriched and empowered. Empowered. Yeah, to uh, go forth now. And it's a lovely life that they live. It's a story of the covenant. You know, with every last detail. And, and the thing that was actually the most important, uh, I think, Kirk, is the realization that Yahweh presents the covenant to Noah. Uh, exactly the same way that he does to Abraham, but with the case of Noah, it's more in your face. And that is that Yahweh didn't build the boat. You know, the Christian myth that salvation is a gift of God and not a result of work, so uh, no one should uh, boast in it, and that uh, salvation is through faith in the gospel of grace. You don't do anything. Yeah. Well, I, not according to Yahweh. Noah was saved not because he didn't do anything. Noah wasn't saved by his faith. He wasn't saved by a gospel. He wasn't saved by grace. He was. He and his family were absolutely saved. But the way they were saved is they listened to what Yahweh had to say and they acted upon it. They responded. All right. All right. And if you want to be part of the covenant... Today, we need to listen to what Yahweh had to say to the one person he presented the covenant to, Abraham. Mm -hmm. And we need to act on his instructions. 
So if we listen to what Yahweh said to Abraham regarding the covenant, just or just listen to what Yahweh said to Noah, and we act upon his instructions, which are the five conditions, we'll be saved too. Even today, you, how how could I how could I carefully examine and continually consider Yahweh's word if I uh, if I didn't do it myself? Of course, yeah. you have to do something. You have to participate. Yeah. I mean, and you notice that in the presentation of Noah, there were uh, clean animals and unclean animals. I mean, he, you know, the animals were two by two to uh, save the animals from that region. <laughs> Yahweh loves life. He, he wanted to save life. He really loves life. But you notice there were clean animals in addition to the, uh, the two by two. You know what they were for? Well, is it food? No, the clean animals. Mm-mm. Oh, the clean animals? Well, yeah. You've got to reproduce. You've got to, you to start over. Well, the clean animals, uh, where he had more than the two-by-two, two. yes, there was some that were for food, but oh, so for the most part, sacrifice, they're, sacrifice. yeah, they're to celebrate the Moed Mikre. I mean, the Moed, yeah. Right. He's going to be, he is going to be celebrating the various days that are being chronicled here, Pesach, Matzah, Bukotam, Shavuah. He is going to be to be celebrating those days with his family, and so they're part of the symbolism of those days. Mm. That's uh, that's the reason why they had uh, these clean animals. But all the way through, you've got to be willing to uh, listen to you know and act upon it. Now, is there any place where uh, where Noah says? Oh, my God, I'm saved. I'm saved at last. Where he just says, oh, you know, God, you saved a wretch like me. Uh, is there any place where we hear this, him and he and his family just, you know, waxing poetic about salvation? No, he's uh, very trusting. Uh, he's, he's, he's more like, um, you've uh, taken care of me. You're my friend. You're my father. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, they they had a relationship, and they were celebrating that relationship. They were enjoying Yahweh's uh, not only protection but uh, Yahweh's guidance, and as such, salvation was a minor factor along the way. Yeah, I understand that salvation is important, but they were celebrating an extension of life. They were celebrating a uh, a restoration of their relationship, but. They weren't doing the Christian thing. Are you saved? No. Did, did Noah once have to ask his uh, sons, are you saved? No, not once. Not once. Yeah, it was oh, but package of benefits include salvation. I mean, the first benefit of the covenant is eternal life. The second is perfection, salvation, if you will. Um, the third is adoption, so that you inherit everything that he has to offer. And then enrichment and empowerment. Power. Yeah. They certainly got that. They were celebrating those things. They weren't wallowing in their uh, in their praise, thanking God for saving. In fact, I'm not even sure that they um, thank, thank them, God. No. Right. No, not in a, that sense. The opposite of the covenant relationship would be institutionalized religion. Mm-hmm. So if the covenant, which is walking away from human institutions to have a relationship with God. If you were to have go the opposite direction, you would have a um, you'd be part of a religious institution, right? Mm-hmm. What's the largest uh, religious institution on the planet today? Um, well, Christianity and Catholic, and, and yeah. is a subset of that. Yeah. Yeah, the religion of Christianity is the largest religion, um, some, what, 2.5 uh, to 3 billion Christians on uh, the planet today. The largest subset of that uh, and the largest religion on the planet would be Roman Catholicism with 1.2 billion um, faithful, followed by the various forms of Orthodox or Eastern uh, Christianity, which is really the the original Roman religion, you know, that the religion of called the Roman Catholic Church. Rome, at the time that it was established as as the Empire of Rome, the the city of Rome uh, no longer existed, and so the the Rome was the 
was in the Eastern, yeah, the Eastern Roman Empire, Constantinople. Uh, and uh, as a as such, you know, you're really dealing with the same institutions, just that that with Roman Catholicism, they've uh, they've held um, a large people, a large group of people together. Well. Well, the Eastern Orthodox, the uh, you know, now has broken into a lot of subsets. So, the largest um, portion of Christianity is Roman Catholicism, followed by the Eastern Orthodox Christianity. Um, and just yesterday, the Pope um, drew a crowd uh, very close to a million people. Amazing. Amazing. In a little country. Amazing. You know, there's a million people who have the time and the means to go and get a glimpse of and listen to the Pope who don't have the time, evidently, or the inclination to read the Torah and get a glimpse of Yahweh and listen to him. No. Why would you do that? Well, I'll tell you a quick story. I have a, one of my students, uh, She, when she was a young girl, she studied one of those lines to uh, kiss this ring or whatever as they're walking, as he comes by, and she stood there forever, and she watched all the hullabaloo, and finally he's, he's a few yards from her, and she says, this is the stupidest thing I've ever done. Why am I doing this? And she walked away. Wow. <laughs> Came home and told her, mother, I'm not going to be a Catholic anymore. Yeah. Yeah, oh, I know. Kissing a man's, kissing a man's ring. What did Yosha say about uh, calling uh, people father? Father, he said, you, "I'm your father." Yeah, yeah don't do it, right? Yeah, don't don't do, it. do it. Don't do it. So, what is the Pope called? Isn't Pope uh, Latin for father? Papa. Yeah, it's Lope. It's Latin for father. He is the Holy Father. The Pope title means father. So, isn't he in direct contradiction to what Yahweh said uh, and Yosha said? We ought not to. Oh, so many things. Yeah. And uh, didn't um, uh, Augustus, Caesar Augustus, Octavian? He was the first papa, yeah. Yeah, he was the first pope, wasn't he? Oh, yeah. And that Julius Caesar, Caesar was a pope. Be, uh, well, as a Caesar, I don't think he ought, like to live long enough to take the title of pope. But uh, Octavian, uh, Augustus sure as heck did. Even oh, yeah. Caligula, Nero. Just passed it on. Yeah, they were popes. And so they, he's using the same title that was uh, used by the Roman Caesars. Mm -hmm. Men who, who pretended that they were God, who dressed up like a God, who had statues made to them like That's they were God. Yeah, who, uh, who, who said that, you know, they spoke for, uh, for God. What's the difference in this pope? Doesn't he use the same title? From the same city, Apparently the with the same, same claims. Oh yeah, same rhetoric. And does not one Roman Catholic ever bother to read what Yahweh had to say about Rome? Well, you just got to have faith, my friend. Don't you understand? Yeah, but Yahweh said uh, that Rome was the most vile of all beasts. Yeah. And the most vicious of all beasts, and that ultimately Rome would trample the whole world down. And it has. And, you know, the Empire of Rome didn't do that. The Empire of Rome uh, trampled down much of Europe, but not all of Europe. No. And really didn't get outside of Europe, you know, a little bit in uh, northern Africa. You know, Carthage uh, isn't in Europe, and they, they certainly uh, pummeled the Carthaginians. Um, and, you know, they went into the, uh, the Promised Land. Israel is not in Europe, and they uh, pummeled them not once but twice. But they really never laid claim to most of uh, of Turkey. They constantly, what is today Turkey, they were constantly battling with the Persians, and and uh, that that was essentially a draw. And and the Germanic territories, they uh, the best they could do was a draw. They got into the Balkans, and and uh, for a while I uh, had uh, held sway, but didn't get much past the Balkans, and certainly uh, controlled Spain, but didn't get past it. And, and so, uh, you know, went as far as Britain, uh, but uh, that was, only, yeah, even that was uh, it was hit and miss. So, did the Empire of Rome ever tread down the whole world? No, Yahweh was talking about uh, the Pope and he was talking about the right. church. 
You know, the, the Empire of Rome was never in uh, South America, was it? No, it certainly didn't have the power to divide it up and give it to two, half and half to two different countries. Yeah, but the Pope, he's, uh, you know, his institution, the Roman Catholic Church is the most powerful institution in South and Central America. That's a place that mm -hmm. Rome uh, never tread. You know, it's got some and the Roman Catholic property. Church is, uh, you know, got an audience with Congress. It's, you know, it's, it's among, if not the largest religious denomination in America. So um, Rome wasn't there either, were they? No, they're powerful. Name yeah, Rome. Uh, Rome didn't get into Asia, not the Asia that we you know what we would consider the Far East. Uh, but the Roman Catholic Church is sure there. Yeah. Roman Catholic Church is in Australia, and New Zealand, but uh, in the South Pacific. But um, Rome never was. Walk around any major city, just about. Uh, All right. Pearl and you'll find you know, Rome never made it much further south than the northern part of uh, the African coast, but the Roman Catholic Church goes all the way to Cape Town. Yep. From tip to tip. Right. So when Daniel's talking about the most vicious of all beasts that's going to tread the whole world, and that that while uh, Rome, when Rome, this this beast, this vicious beast that treads the whole world, will endure right to the end. There is no other institution out of Rome that took all of the Roman vestiges of power. The papal name, the location of its, uh, of, uh, its power, um, and even right down to the smallest details, the Roman Catholic Church is, uh, is an outgrowth of the institution of Rome. As a matter of fact, um, Theodosius, um, who reigned about 400 CE, about 75 years after Constantine, he is the one that that made Christianity and the Roman Catholic Church synonymous with the Empire of Rome. There was no distinction between them anymore. No. I was just thinking, what's the most famous building in Moscow? Uh, the uh, the Kremlin. Well, in the Kremlin, right. Pardon? what's the most famous in there is that church building, which is the right. Which is Saint Isaac's, isn't that what it is? Oh yeah, I think so. I mean, everywhere yeah. you go. I mean, this is a but the philosophy is is more powerful than their their land. Oh, yeah. In fact, it's every just, every building in uh, in the Kremlin. In fact, I think actually uh, Saint Isaac's is uh, is just. Oh, I've been there. It's uh, it's in Red Square, but it's outside of the Kremlin. The Kremlin is uh, you know behind the wall, mm -hmm. and you've got the tomb to uh, to Lenin right there. But outside of the Kremlin is Saint Isaac's, and uh, uh, it is a uh, it's uh, the Roman yeah. Orthodox Church, which is an outgrowth of the Eastern Orthodox Church, which was the Church of Rome. But Roman, nonetheless, if you didn't, if you don't understand the Eastern mm -hmm. and Western Empire, though, then you won't understand the Torahless one coming from. Alexander's place in the Roman Empire. That's why the right. preachers always put him somewhere in Europe when he's really, well, Europe, yes, but, you know, Western. Yeah, Macedonia is where he's going to come Macedonia. from because it is a, an intersection between Alexander the, uh, the Great and, uh, and the Greek Macedonian Empire that he um, uh, conquered. And um, the Roman Empire and the intersection between those two is Macedonia. So if you can right. figure that part out, why can't you figure out that the church is who he's talking about? You know, oh, yeah. really? it's, um, it's, it's, there is no question that the beast that is Rome is uh, that, that this core of Babylon today is the Roman Catholic Church. Almost every aspect of Roman Catholicism is predicated on the Babylonian religion. Uh -huh. uh, you know, Very from right from... It's sun god worship, and it's halos, and it's trinity, and it's Christmas, and it's Easter, and it's Sunday veneration. Um, it's it's cardinals, it's uh, it's nuns. It, that's all part of the Babylonian religion. It's holy water. Uh, it's mass. All Babylonian. Okay, the monster cakes and the round uh, circle. Cake. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that uh, that are Eucharist cakes because, of course, they don't uh, they don't do matzah. Circles on the shape of the sun. You know everything. You know if you look at even the Roman Catholic crosses, a cross which is a pagan symbol, mm -hmm. and they all have little sunbursts around them. There's sunbursts and halos everywhere. It's an outgrowth of the Roman uh, 
worship of the sun, the unconquerable sun, and Mithraism, which were blended together, of, uh, and uh, along with the Greek worship of, uh, of Zeus and Dionysus. It's a blend, and it's, that's what's at play in the last days. That's why it's so interesting to see how Pauline Christianity was based upon the Gnosticism of the Greeks and how his Jesus quotes Dionysus and, and almost every aspect of Pauline Christianity is based upon the, um, the Greek philosophy and religion. That's, and that's that whole idea, the, uh, the spirit is good, the flesh is bad. Mm-hmm. That's Greek Gnosticism. Yeah. But you don't find it. Yahweh never speaks of the flesh as being bad. Ever. He thinks it's good. He created it. He really likes it. Yeah. And so, uh, that whole spirit is good, flesh is bad, the Torah is of the flesh, which is Pauline Christianity, that's all part of Greek Gnosticism and wholly separated from God. It's amazing. It's just so sad. It must really, really trouble God to see almost a million people venerate this wicked man known as the Pope. Welcome back to the last segment of Shattering Myths for today. And Kirk, if I'm bothered by the fact that so many people flock to churches and that this Pope is taking his tour through Latin America and there will be at times a million people that will be looking up to him as if he were God's representative. It's just such a tragedy because... It is just a statement of fact. There have been exactly zero Roman Catholics saved. And if you just want to use the Christian vernacular, there's not been a single Roman Catholic in the past 2,000 years who has been saved. Not one. Let me, can I say a quick thing about Noah that's pertinent to that? Sure. In the ninth verse, ninth uh, of the ninth chapter, God says um, that he establishes his covenant with you and your seed. Now, he's talking to Noah and his sons. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's the same covenant. It's always the same covenant. It's the same approach. And if you want to extrapolate a little bit from that, remember Jephus, the son, and Ham, they become Asia and and Africa and Europe. Mm -hmm. So he's offered this to the whole world when he offers it to Noah's children. Because mm-hmm. that's the whole world, so it's not like yeah. it's restricted to just Abraham's children. You know, well, so what you're dealing with here is just another more tangible expression yeah. Yeah. of the benefits of the covenant with Abraham. You know, it's your seed and uh, and your seed, you know, your children and, and your seed after uh, them for all generations. But all in here, he's just saying, you know, your children are becoming the world. Yeah. So he's talking, you know, very specifically that the deal was always offered to the whole world, and the whole world rejects it. So it's not yeah. like it's not like Paul saying, you know, uh, this was a Jewish thing or something. This right. was the, the covenant was always offered. He didn't offer a different one, and he offered mm-hmm. it right here. Here's the covenant to Noah. Right. And by the way, you know, the way as we've gone through this covenant, and Yahweh calls it a covenant. You just read the statement. Yeah. As Yahweh. Uh, goes through the covenant with Abraham, does he say, you know, this is a different covenant than I offered to Noah? No. No. Is it is the covenant with Abraham the New Testament? No. No. Covenant, covenant is uh, the same, the same exact covenant. Yo, show. You know, and so, so he's here, she's telling you that the Noah story is a tangible expression. Uh, of the process of being part of his family, the process and the benefit. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it don't change the words. Even the, even the English authors didn't change the word. It's, yes, it is pretty amazing that he not only emphasizes that this is the covenant that I'm establishing with you, your family, and your seed uh, after you, mm-hmm. which is the same terminology he uses with uh, Abraham, but tangibly the sons represent the various... Peoples around the world. Uh, yeah. We know where we can trace them. We know where they went. Right. We know where Jeff right. went. They, you know, Asia, Europe, right. down, Asia, and Africa. Right. It's not a, it's not a secret. It's, no, it's nothing hidden here. 
here's one of the cute things. You'll appreciate this. On the third chapter, it says, uh, every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. That's for your food. The <laughs> <laughs> uh, reason that we think that's so funny is yeah. that is that when uh, Yahweh created a uh, a uh, the opportunity for us to eat anything we wanted, uh, Yahweh said specifically that so long as you're thoughtful about it, uh, you, know, you can eat anything you want. Um, when Yahweh said that, which he needed to say, uh, so that that a religion which was born out of its kosher food laws wouldn't hoodwink people. Um, so Yahweh has a this uh, exemption. You can uh, you can eat whatever you want. It is interesting that it's not the first time that he gave that exemption. He gave that exemption to Noah. I know. So, and then, by the way, when I when I explain to people that an exemption isn't a change. Uh, there are times where, when the rule applies because the rule is really important for the health of his uh, children. And there's times when he offers the exemption that, uh, that when I said that this was an exemption, translated the, the passages and spoke about why the exemption was so important and how Yosh himself affirms the exe uh, exemption. Uh, and boy, did I have people that came out with their daggers. That wasn't it. Wasn't uh, the the core of the covenant with our family? But some people um, did come out with their daggers, and and so it is nice <laughs> to find another affirmation of the exemption. Yeah, so long as you're thoughtful about it, eat right. uh, whatever you want. Uh, God's not into establishing rules. Uh, there are terms and conditions of the covenant, but they set us free. They are for our benefit. And so Yahweh is teaching and guiding us with all of the examples throughout his Torah. May Yah bless.